Greetings and welcome to today's webinar on tools for scaling up viral load monitoring. My name is Pia Kochar and I am the Knowledge Management Coordinator for the AIDS Free Project. Before we begin today's presentations, I'd like to quickly review the Adobe Connect environment and set a few norms for today's webinar. Today's webinar has four presentations followed by a discussion period during which our speakers will address your questions. Within the webinar environment, please make use of the Q&A box on the bottom right side of your screen to share your thoughts, note your questions, or ask for help with sound during the presentation. Questions you ask are only visible to you, our presenters, and technical support. If you are experiencing difficulties, our technical support will respond to your question privately. We will collect your questions for our speakers and will save them for the discussion period. It is great that we are able to connect people from so many places today, but your experience may vary based on your internet connection and computer equipment. I will briefly go over a few troubleshooting steps if you have technology challenges today. A few troubleshooting tips. If you lose connectivity or cannot hear, close the webinar. Re-enter the meeting room in a browser other than Google Chrome by clicking on the webinar link provided. Use the Q&A box to ask AIDS Free Tech for assistance. If the troubleshooting steps are not successful, please rest assured the webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording following today's event. Questions that don't get answered during the Q&A sessions will be compiled after the webinar, shared with presenters, and responses from presenters will be shared with participants. To get us started, I will now turn it over to our co-moderator, Alex Frazzo. Thank you so much, Pia. I'd like to welcome and thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Alex Frazzo, HIV AIDS Clinical Service Advisor for USAID. Today's webinar is being organized by AIDS Free, and I will be co-moderating with Sabrina Egan, HIV AIDS Advisor for AIDS Free. For today's webinar, we've gathered experts in the viral load field to highlight the network approach to scale up and to also feature two tools that can be used by country teams in assessing readiness and in building capacity for laboratory diagnostic programs. I would now like to introduce our first speaker today, Jane Feinberg of John Snow, Inc., to introduce AIDS Free Viral Load and Early Infant Diagnosis Knowledge Base. Jane, over to you. Thank you, Alex. And good morning, everyone, or good day, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. It's great to see uh, so many people joining from all over the world. My name is Jane Feinberg. I'm a senior technical advisor with JSI. Shirley, may I ask you to mute so that we don't have so much feedback? Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. So I'm here today to uh, make sure that you know about an important resource recently launched on the AIDS Free website. First, I just want to give a little background about AIDS Free. The Strengthening High Impact Interventions for an AIDS Free Generation Project, known uh, in short as AIDS Free, aims to improve the quality and effectiveness of high impact, evidence based HIV and AIDS interventions in order to meet country specific goals and objectives. AIDS Free is a five-year cooperative agreement led by JSI with partners, APT Associates, EGPATH, and COMPASS, IMA World Health, the International HIV AIDS Alliance, JAPIGO, and PATH. AIDS Free is funded and managed by USAID's Office of HIV AIDS. So why did we uh, create an AIDS Free Viral Load Early Infant Diagnosis Knowledge Base. Since 2013, 
viral load testing is the preferred approach to monitoring patient response to antiretroviral therapy. And, and WHO has since 2008 recommended prompt initiation of ART in infants diagnosed with HIV infection. This requires early infant diagnosis, which we refer to as EID. And as of 2010, virologic testing is recommended for diagnosis of HIV in children under 18 months. So both of these uh, recommendations or preferred approaches require um, increased capacity to offer viral load and EID testing. Indeed, many countries have adopted these recommendations are in the and are in the process of building viral load and early infant diagnosis capacity. This can be challenging. Um, so the AIDS-free HIV viral load and early infant diagnosis knowledge base is a collection of resources and tools to help people, countries, you listening, program planners and managers, healthcare workers, laboratory technicians and others find what they need to scale up viral load and early infant diagnosis. Um, AIDS redeveloped this database with USAID and is uh, continuously updating the resource. And I'll, um, at the end of my presentation, let you know um, how to be in touch if you want to suggest additional resources that should be added. This is a screenshot of the knowledge base on the AIDS Free website. The URL is aidsfree.usaid.gov forward slash resources forward slash VL dash EID. And uh, we'll be sending that URL out in a, in a follow-up email after the webinar, and of course, it will be captured in the recording. Um, and I'll probably read it at least one more time before I wrap up. You may have noticed from the screenshot that the resources in the VL in EID knowledge base are filed either under viral load or under early infant diagnosis and further divided into categories. And the five categories are global guidance and country experiences, laboratory management, logistics, clinical implementation, and monitoring and evaluation. The AIDS-free HIV viral load and early infant diagnosis knowledge base currently houses over 50 documents and tools, including recently released viral load scale-up tools de developed by ASLM, uh, the African Society for Laboratory Management, WHO, CDC, USAID, CHI, and others, including the tools in this sample list, which are just some of the um, documents in, in the knowledge base. Um, these include a clinician and laboratory and training tool, guidance for developing a specimen network and referral system for viral load and infant virologic HIV diagnosis testing, a costing framework tool, an inventory and forecasting tool, an m and &E framework for viral load scale up and implementation, an HIV viral load scorecard, which I think we're going to hear more about in this webinar and a, VL, a viral load scale-up facility readiness assessment. So these are just some examples of materials that are available in the knowledge base. Uh, all of the documents in the knowledge base are quite new. Most of them are not more than a couple years old, um, with, a, with a few exceptions um, of documents that may be from 2009 or, or 2010, but that were still deemed uh, valuable. And, and, and helpful. So um, to learn more and to contribute to the knowledge base, please visit the AIDS Free website. Uh, again, that's aidsfree.usaid.gov. And to go directly to the knowledge base, forward slash resources, forward slash VL dash EID. As I mentioned, AIDS3 is reaching out to partners and scanning for additional documents and tools to grow the information in this knowledge base. You can suggest 
additional documents and tools we should consider adding by contacting me. My email address is here. It's jane underscore feinberg at jsi.com. You can also sign up to receive updates from AID3 uh, by going to the AID3 website, aid3.usa.gov forward slash email. I hope you'll um, visit the AID3 website and have a look at the resources available. So thanks from, from AID3, from, from me at JSI. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, so please, if you have questions for Jane or any follow-up comments, then please go ahead and add those into the Q&A box that you see on your screen. We're going to move to our next presentation, which will be presented. That's fine. That's what everyone says, says as much. Of. And I think she'll probably correct my um, Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk Thank to you, you about a viral load scorecard um, that we have developed uh, in collaboration with uh, USAID. Um, and um, the learning objectives uh, for the scorecard, this is, I want to mention that the document has been undergoing um, continuous refinement. It has been piloted in multiple labs. Um, and we should have a final version, which will be able to, you'll be able to see on your website within the next week. Um, so the learning objectives for the viral load scorecard are to demonstrate how to perform um, uh, an audit using the scorecard um, to assess where our laboratories are currently with viral load scale up and their ability to meet um, targets that the country has set for viral load. Um, at the end of uh, this brief session that I'm going to talk about, um, you should be able to, when you see the tool, you should be able to know how to uh, use the tool to conduct an audit using um, a user's guide following the viral load scorecard along with it. The purpose of auditing our laboratories, and we use audit for lack of a better term. It really is an assessment tool um, that gives you an indication of uh, how the lab performs at various steps and, and what is needed to actually do viral load testing testing and also to make sure that those results are forwarded onward to um, the clinical centers so that um, they are utilized for patient management. The purpose of the audit is to identify areas where improvement is needed, measure improvements as gaps are addressed, um, develop and implement a work plan to assess the gaps, implement quality assurance elements, monitor quality progress, and maintain continuous quality improvement. During the audit process, um, we ask that uh, the laboratories um, complete uh, the scorecard in advance, which helps facilitate uh, going through uh, the instrument in a timely manner. It does take about two hours to go through the scorecard in total. Uh, that's with verification of the documents and the processes that they have in place. Um, during the auditing process, we uh, provide feedback at the end and um, follow up to determine compliance thereafter. So this is the, the front of what the scorecard looks like. There's a user's guide that uh, accompanies that. And um, the user's guide uh, indicates to you how to go through the scorecard efficiently. And uh, we developed the user's guide so that we would have uniform collection of the information within the scorecard. So um, the scorecard itself evaluates the test uh, site going through um, individual steps from the beginning to the end. You review the viral load and antivirologic testing site records. You observe the virologic, um, the antivirologic test EID and viral load site operations. Um, ask open-ended questions and uh, discover the path for, for the specimen from the collection to the results reporting. There's a pre-assessment phase, identifying sites, notifying the sites, and agreeing on the audit dates. 
conveying the importance of the viral load and infravirologic testing checklist. You familiarize yourself with the checklist. Then there's the assessment phase, uh, introducing the audit team, um, and then discussing the purpose of the audit, conducting the assessment using the checklist. And then the post-assessment phase, debrief with the site management on the findings and recommendations, and then agree on um, a plan forward to improve areas of weakness or deficiency. So part of the uh, scorecard um, is looking directly at the records that exist at the testing site. Uh, you are to review qual the quality manual uh, and policies, SOPs, um, any other manuals such as safety manuals if they have one. If they don't have manuals for things, then look at um, uh, SOPs that they may have. Make sure that they're complete, they're current, they're accurate, and they're reviewed annually. Usually there's a sign-off for that process, so you look for not only um, seeing that they have it, but that they have been reviewed by the staff, and there's a record of that. You look at the la laboratory records as far as equipment maintenance, which is a, a significant challenge with um, many of our laboratories in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, daily maintenance is required, and uh, that um, uh, when it's not, then that's a cause for a lot of equipment breakdown. Audit trails, incident reports, look at logs, personnel files, their internal quality control records, and proficiency testing records. You observe uh, the site operations uh, directly. Laboratory testing follows should follow written policies and procedures in the pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic phases. Laboratory procedures are appropriate um, for the testing perform. Um, if uh, some, sometimes there's, the testing is ongoing while you're there, if that's the case, then you want to observe the procedure. Uh, if you have the opportunity, if not, discuss the procedure from start to finish. Look for non-conformities identified. Um, and if they're adequately investigated and if they have been resolved and documented. Ask open-ended questions. Uh, often, if you just ask, uh, do you do this or do you do that, the answer is, is uh, uh, often yes, or 90% of the time I would say yes. But if you ask open-ended questions, that, that allows them to explain uh, their process um, and, um, and you get a more informed answer. Um, ask questions like show me how or tell me about. An experienced auditor can often learn to answer multiple questions through open-ended questions with the laboratory staff. Discover the path of the specimen. Follow a sample through the lab from collection through registration, preparation, analyzing, result verification, reporting, printing, and post-analytic handling and storing of samples to determine the strength of the laboratory operations. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, sometimes that you have the ability to witness that firsthand. Other times, it may be that they're not performing the procedure on the day that you go, but they can walk you through the process. Confirm uh, the internal quality control results are recorded, um, that all the runs are reviewed for validation. Confirm the PT results. Evaluate the quality and efficiency of supported work areas. Talk to the clinicians if you have the opportunity to learn the user perspective on the laboratory's performance. For reporting, the notes should be written neatly and documented. The scorecard should be properly and fully completed. Um, this can be done on tablet form, does not have to be done by hand. Ideally, it's done on a tablet, so for the ease of collecting the data and downloading. Nonconformance forms are completed and linked to the specific requirement. Um, check that the accuracy of the findings are verified, and a copy of the report can be given to the laboratory. Dissemination of your findings, the information is provided to the head of the laboratory, to the quality assurance officer, uh, to the testing site personnel that are relevant to the audit, to program coordinators, to the regional and district program coordinator, to facility managers, and implementing partners. Following the audit, you'll provide the recommendations. Um, ideally, you sit down and discuss any areas of uh, deficiency, review and the exit summation report, 
plan corrective actions uh, jointly uh, with the laboratory personnel, develop a plan and time frame for the corrections, and develop uh, an official report. So thank you. Thank you so much, Shirley. Please continue adding your questions into the questions and answer box for our discussion session later. The next presentation is from Diana Edgel and Jason Williams of USAID. Over to you, Jason and Diana. Thank you. So we're going to take a kind of a, a two-presenter approach here. I'm going to uh, basically kind of open up and uh, kind of set the stage, and then Diana uh, will kind of uh, finish up the presentation and talk more about uh, our, our kind of overall network approach and overall strategy to address some of the things that we're seeing as part of uh, the network development aspects of uh, viral load instrument deployment and some of the challenges that are, are currently coming to light as countries uh, initiate scale up. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the core components of our load and EID scale up, some things that we're, we're targeting. Uh, I'll show you some numbers and instruments, a little bit on um, current demand and how that aligns with current instrument deployments. And then Diana will wrap things up and get more into some of the, the specifics regarding the overall network approach. So we think about some of the, the core components. I think many folks have actually probably seen this slide, uh, but there's there's four core kind of core areas uh, for successful viral load EID scale up. Uh, there's obviously the lab components where the, the instruments sit, uh, where uh, staff training and QA and uh, result return kind of methods are kind of uh, prioritized. Uh, then we have some of the logistics piece, which is the shop that I kind of and myself, Diana, work in, which is uh, essentially around the procurement uh, and some of the forecasting aspects of uh developing plans for procurement. Uh, we do have maintenance as a key piece here also. Um, one of the challenges that we have uh, in regards to um, the commodities component is that it's not people consuming products. Uh, these are instruments, so the, the maintenance um, issues need to be addressed as part of ensuring a continuity of service, but also to ensure that we are um, using the commodities effectively and efficiently. Um, M&E is also a very big piece of what we do. Uh, it is a data-driven system, uh, commodities as well as obviously the clinical lab interface and ensuring um, adequate uh, patient care in response to the, um, uh, the viral load results that are coming out from the lab. This is the, the viral load uh, EID cycle. Uh, we've kind of split it up into four key areas. Again, these are all systems. Um, I think about the sample collection component, um, the network that we kind of uh, look at here, uh, we have two different types of sample types. We have DBS, which is predominantly uh, uh, priority for the EID, uh, but now as we move into Abbott platforms in the field uh, is a core sample type also for viral load. The sample referral is a, a big obstacle that we're looking at also. We see that um, um, some of the tools that Diana will speak to in a few minutes will help us uh, kind of map lab networks and identify ways to optimize those core pieces of the sample referral network. We have the result return forms, and then we have the actual use uh, of the results as part of clinical care. As we think about the uh, number of machines that are actually deployed uh, within countries, uh, we see significant shifts over the past uh, six months. Uh, here is just a kind of a graphic representation of some, um, some of the larger countries. Uh, if we look at the, the blue bars, we're seeing uh, instrument counts provided directly from the manufacturers uh, in May. And as we move into uh, the beginning of this year, we can see some significant growth in some of the core areas. Uh, it's interesting that some of the numbers have actually gone down, uh, and this is because of uh, instrument replacements uh, changing to higher volume machines, as well as getting further clarity from the countries in regards to uh, which machines are used as part of the MIH uh, HIV-related programs. I think one of the things that we're learning very, very quickly here is that 
as we model and try to optimize uh, the lab network, it becomes very, very difficult for um, any one group of individuals to actually understand how many machines are actually within a particular country since we have so many players and stakeholders that are contributing to the overall network. Here we're just looking at uh, the instrument capacity uh, based on current instrument counts for uh, just the Abbott and Roche platforms uh, and aligning that with the actual viral load and EID demands from 2016. And you can see that some countries obviously do have significant access capacity in relation to the actual patients that are currently on treatment. Those that actually have um, more capacity uh, than demand, uh, obviously there's some issues there, but when we do see uh, demand increasing uh, capacity, I just want to point out the fact that a lot of these countries are actually in the process of scaling up, and this would be basically their, their target for 100 percent uh, coverage uh, based on the um, 2016 uh, test demand. This next slide is just kind of illustrating some of the uh, Gen Expert instrument module procurements as well as cartridges. Um, uh, I know that a lot of folks are interested in uh, Gen Expert as well as the LAQ so for EID. I think that um, perhaps if we, this is the global, is uh, but if we from, actually do touch on just Africa, we're looking at around 13,000 modules for Africa and about 15.5 million tests. We're um, well, life of in, projects. In the since we have been thinking about laboratories uh, for just the continent of Africa. Individual structures so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand this over to Diana. Them. Diana will talk Sometimes more about how uh, we're actually addressing some of the network related issues. Funding that are very specific to a, a certain implementing partner or a region within a country. Uh, what we're advocating for based on the, the fact that there are so many pieces of equipment that come from a particular manufacturer all of which are supporting the public health network um, and, the, and, the, and the healthcare system within an individual country. And because of the, 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 the need to rely on the underlying systems that Jason pointed out, such as your sample referral network, such as your supply chain system, such as your waste management system, that we should be treating our laboratory network as a network rather than as a series of individual uh, laboratories with individual needs. Um, and this is specifically in the case of, uh, of, of our conversation with manufacturers. Right now what we're seeing is that, that individual machines based on, on, the, on whether or not those machines are, are um, or, the, or the, the, the individual within the laboratory has a good relationship with the manufacturer or in-country distributor, and often based on the in-country distributor, some machines are receiving better support than others. Some machines, based on the donor uh, funding source, are, are receiving a better price per test than others. Um, some machines are not covered under a service maintenance warranty, whereas a machine in the building next door is covered under service maintenance warranty or, or a warranty. And so what we're advocating for at this point is for, for us all to come to some understanding of what it means for, <clears throat> for us to have a laboratory network, how many machines exist within our network, what the capacity is for those machines, what the throughput is for those machines, whether they are over or underutilized, um, what, the, what the, the commodities needs are going to be for those machines, and to do so as, as essentially as, as, a, as one team, um, agnostic of, of implementing partner, agnostic of funding stores, um, agnostic really of, of anything but their role in supporting your healthcare system. So in order to do that, uh, what you first need is, is a baseline mapping of your system. Um, we are definitely advocating for that in any way, shape, or form, but we do have a tool that can help, and I'll, I'll be presenting a bit on that tool in just a bit. Um, and from the baseline mapping, from an understanding of what your sample referral network should look like, from an understanding of what your supply chain should look like, and from an understanding, hopefully, um, uh, ultimately of what your, your commodities needs are going to be, you can then have a more um, fruitful discussion with manufacturers about what should be one per test cost that is all inclusive of your service and maintenance, of your connectivity solutions, of training for your staff over time, of any additional technology support that you might need. And we've, we've just pulled out barcoding, 
sample processing and workflow analyses as some that, that manufacturers might also support. Um, and of enhanced commodity management strategies like, um, for example, vendor managed inventory wherein instead of having your laboratory staff having to keep tabs on stock needs, your, the manufacturer would also be keeping tabs on those stock needs and would be informing you when you start to run low on a specific reagent. Next slide. So, and, and you know, as you probably have understood from, from that last slide, this is definitely going to need to be coordinated amongst donors, amongst all stakeholders in country with the, the full support and leadership of the Ministry of Health, um, with all of the IPs uh, on board. Otherwise, uh, we, we, we find that there is still uncoordinated procurement, that machines continue to arrive in country, and that manufacturers, in fact, can use um, that, that, that uh, this coordinated, uncoordinated, uh, I guess, conversation and procurement to continue to, to, to you know, expand the system in a way that may not make sense in the context of the entire network. Um, we also are advocating for the development of, of supply plans based on that network. Um, we feel that data is important to this, to, to, to an ongoing understanding of your system. Um, and that reagent rental and bundling of services is something that, that, that will be ultimately supportive of manufacturer investment in your system. So as you're moving through your decision to expand your capacity, if you feel that that is necessary once you've done a mapping of your network, additional equipment should be placed by manufacturers and they should, in, they should own and invest in your system um, rather than you setting aside the, the initial investment for that piece of equipment and then being stuck with a piece of equipment that either isn't, isn't supported by the manufacturer or in a few years becomes obsolete and you then need to, to, to further invest in the system. So we're definitely advocating for, for, for rental or leasing options. Um, we're also advocating for the development of an adherence to criteria for placement of additional machines. And one of the ways in which you can do this is to go through that mapping exercise and to then come up with agreed upon criteria for the appropriate placement of additional platforms based on their, on their throughput um, on, and based on whether they are uh, conventional, near to point of care, or point of care, and what you see your needs as being in country. Um, and then, of course, as, as I've just indicated, the integration of POC platforms into current networks is necessary. In the past with POC, what we've seen is that they have not been integrated effectively into, into a network. Um, and I'll move on to the next slide to, to talk about that a bit more. So uh, we're all interested in, in point of care, um, and I think that there, there may be a, a, a very optimistic um, assumption that some of the point of care technologies are going to fix the, the issues that, that we're seeing in country with our current conventional laboratory network. What we saw with, with CD4 point of care platforms was, it, was that this wasn't necessarily the case, that those pieces of equipment sometimes were utilized appropriately and were installed appropriately. The WHO had released a, 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 an article um, earlier in the, or maybe later in, in 2016, uh, indicating that up to 40% of instruments weren't even installed in countries. And we also, through, um, through our supply chain systems, have seen that, that, that a, a, a large number of those machines were placed at points within the system where, they were, where, where those, um, those patients were already being covered by conventional technologies. And so when you look at the number of additional CD4 tests being performed in an individual country, you actually don't see uh, very much of an increase based on the addition of point of care equipment. Now, what that indicates to us is that, in fact, we are taking tests away from the conventional network and putting them through point of care rather than augmenting the system in any way and increasing access to patients, which is, which is I think, not ideal and not what we had intended. 
So for point of care for molecular diagnostics, now we have two machines that have been approved by WHO prequalification for diagnostics program um, for use in um, infant virologic testing. And that, those are the AlairQ and the Gene Expert machines. Um, they, they are machines that are at two different stages. The AlairQ is a totally new technology, whereas the Gene Expert exists, and most countries have many of these machines that are already in use for TB programs. Um, what hasn't been worked out for these machines for specifically for HIV-related molecular diagnostics is where they are best, uh, where they are most appropriately placed. And so we're advocating for a network approach that includes the development of criteria for point of care so that when you are expanding your network, if you, it, it, at, you know, as you think through your access issues in remote regions, as you think through what a network looks like, especially in the case of unlike um, conventional platforms, the, the possibility of having hundreds of these point-of-care machines in country, you are as well having that conversation with manufacturers about their support for the network. Um, when, when it comes to conventional platforms, if you've got five or ten, it's a, a relatively easier situation for a manufacturer to know where all of those machines are and to provide some level of support for them. When you have hundreds of machines and it's not really clear where they are and they're somewhat more mobile than a conventional platform, um, we all start to lose control of our, of our system. And so, you know, up front, having that, that conversation with manufacturers, I think, is going to be critical. So these are the, 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 the next set of slides, sets of, or the next two slides, rather, I should say, are, are, are the tools that, that, that can help you to come to a better understanding of what your network looks like and how your network can evolve um, over time. So the first is a lab equip tool. The lab equip tool is a network mapping and optimization tool. Um, essentially, for lab equip, you can use it as a straight mapping tool where you take in coordinates of, your, of, of all of the elements of your healthcare system, facilities, um, if you have a sample referral network already designed, your hub and spoke, um, <clears throat> hubs and spokes, as well as your laboratories. And from there, you can determine what your footprint looks like, how many machines you have. Um, the, you, can, you can input specific assumptions around the quality of the laboratory itself based on, on, uh, on your proficiency testing data. If you, have, uh, if, if you are a part of a proficiency testing program in country, you can put in any information that you have about utilization of those pieces of equipment. You can, if, if, from, if from your um, supply chain network you have any information about the, 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 the amount of product that has been bought for those machines or delivered to those sites over time. You can also look through um, the efficiency of each of those laboratories. So if you've got consumption data and you've also got your service statistics, um, the, the difference between the two of them can tell you whether or not you are, you're wasting quite a bit of, of that, that, uh, those consumables that, or reagents that go into, into your site. Um, it can allow you to, to input uh, information about human resources capacity as well as information about um, equipment downtime. So from, from all of those pieces of information, then you can have a relatively good understanding of how functional your current network is. And then the lab equip software also includes an optimization algorithm. Um, that algorithm allows you then to, to include additional assumptions about what your sample referral network might look like based on what you know about the operation of individual laboratories. And it can help you to redesign your network or to design a backup network um, or, or you know, any other number of, of different uh, sort of dynamic options where you would be managing your laboratory network over time. If you have um, if, if you have a laboratory, for example, that, that has a piece of equipment that has been utilized at 40 percent, um, and then you see that you are increasing your utilization um, and suddenly you are now at 80 percent with that particular platform, you can then start to understand whether or not you need to place an additional piece of equipment in that laboratory or you need another laboratory to help you with your network over time. So the lab equip tool 
um, is, is useful for understanding your network. The next tool is, is the Forlab tool, which many people have, uh, have experience with. It's been used in, I think, 23 countries in, in Africa at this point. Um, and the forecasting tool, based on your laboratory network, can then help you to understand your commodity needs over time. Both of these tools are linked on the ASLM website and are also linked <clears throat> through the AIDS-free um, web resource as well. So, and, and if you have any questions about the use of those tools, um, you can always come to Jason and myself, um, and I think our email information is at the end of this presentation, but I can't remember. So I'll, we'll see in just a second. So some of the takeaways here are that we are definitely advocating for a network approach. Planning and procurement must be coordinated amongst the donors. Um, reagent rental is the way to go as you develop your Thank you. So I'm happy to spend a few minutes uh, this morning talking about Project ECHO. And ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And it is a model of evidence-based distance learning and mentorship that was developed at the University of New Mexico to improve access to care for complex health problems for underserved populations. So there are some key elements of uh, the ECHO model. And that includes the use of hub and spoke networks. And so what that Thanks means is that there's a Diane hub of subject matter experts um, and that connect with spoke sites where Diane participants um, are located at uh, these uh, spoke sites at distant locations Hattie, from the hub. From the and the and hub and spoke connect via video conferencing. And so the picture you see on the right side of the screen is um, is a snapshot of what the video conferencing uh, screen would look like, where um, this is the gallery view, and you can see um, all of the participants um, at the spoke sites, as well as individual subject matter experts and a hub of subject matter experts. ECHO is also a case-based learning platform. Um, so the typical ECHO session is structured to begin with about 15 to 20 minutes of a didactic presented by a subject matter expert, and then it's followed by case presentations from participants at the spoke site. And then finally, um, ECHO really focuses on the management of chronic diseases. So um, the, the ECHO program was started by the University of New Mexico in 2006. And for those of you who may not um, be familiar with, with New Mexico, it is a large state in the United States and very rural. And um, uh, the ECHO program was started to um, help connect the subject matter experts for hepatitis C with providers in the rural areas of New Mexico because patients were traveling a very long distance to, to get their hepatitis C treatment from the experts. And um, what ECHO did was allow those, those experts to connect with the local providers so that the patients could uh, be managed closer to their home. But one point I want to make, which is important, is that ECHO is not telemedicine, which is, um, you know, telemedicine is really a model where a subject matter expert is overseeing or managing the care of a patient from afar. Rather, what ECHO is, is um, uh, ECHO promotes uh, the um, increasing the capacity of the providers to manage the, the patients themselves. So um, in that sense, it's considered a, a mechanism of demonopolizing medical knowledge and, um, and really building the skills of the, of the local providers to um, manage patients themselves. So um, what do you really need to start an ECHO program? Um, some of the key essentials are the support and leadership of stakeholders. So in the countries that we've supported with ECHO programs, um, the ministries of health as well as the key education and training institutions are, are the, some of the stakeholders. Um, and uh, you really need a basic in internet infrastructure and connectivity. The ECHO program thus far has been using the Zoom platform, which is a cloud-based platform, um, very easy to use, user-friendly, um, and can even be downloaded 
as an app on a mobile device. Um, and when we're thinking about where to implement ECHO, uh, we also look for implementing partners in countries whose scope of work includes clinical mentorship so that ECHO could fall under one of those activities. And then another um, uh, important thing is to have a partnership with the Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico because they are really the global experts on this model and their input can really um, elevate the quality of the ECHO program. So in this um, current PEPFAR area of era of, of promoting um, treatment for all HIV positive patients and um, increasing rapidly the number of patients on ART, it's essential that we find ways of training healthcare workers and more and more healthcare workers and keeping up their clinical skills in a cost efficient and sustainable way. And so our division at the CDC identified ECHO as one um, key intervention to consider to help support PEPFAR in, in, this, um, in this goal of achieving epidemic control. So uh, the reason to, to pursue the ECHO model um, to do this is because ECHO is accessible and it's cost efficient. Um, it, it really offers a means of providing clinical mentorship and continuing professional education credits to healthcare workers while they remain at their posts and um, therefore reducing the cost related to travel and limiting their time away from seeing patients. ECHO also fosters the development of peer networks and communities of practice which have been shown to reduce uh, pro provider isolation and improve provider satisfaction. And um, it's a very flexible model. It, it offers the opportunity to address numerous uh, programmatic pr priorities, including operational issues, clinical issues, laboratory issues, and we'll see some examples of that. So with this in mind, um, our division helps support the launch of the first ECHO program in, or HIV ECHO in Africa in the country of Namibia in November of 2015. And so these are some pictures from the launch in Namibia. And uh, the picture on the bottom right uh, is a picture of the hub of experts at Windhoek, in Windhoek, the capital of Namibia. And um, this hub was seated at the Ministry of Health. And then the picture on the top right corner as well as the bottom left corner are pictures of uh, two spoke sites in Namibia. And um, what you can see here is that when a participant from the spoke is speaking, their picture gets enlarged on the screen so that other participants can view them more clearly. Here's a map of Namibia. And um, at the center, you see Windhoek, which is where the hub of, of the ECHO program was. And then you see the 10 spoke sites that are located throughout the country. Um, so during the, the course of the pilot year for this program, actually um, an additional 10 sites uh, joined the ECHO sessions. And uh, so it was, it was clear that this, this program was catching on and that it was very well received and that uh, participants liked it and were it was gaining a lot from it. Um, there were an average of 72 participants in the ECHO sessions per week. And as you can see, there were a significant number of training hours that were earned. And, and this was actually a motivational factor for Namibia um, to launch this program because its providers were indicating that it was a challenge for them to meet their minimal training requirements. The HIV ECHO program in Namibia really focused on the clinical management of patients with HIV. And so um, the sample of topics that were addressed during the ECHO sessions is, is uh, shown there on the slide. This past year, in 2016, the CDC International Laboratory Branch also launched a lab-based ECHO, which focused on rapid testing. Um, so the ECHO programs were launched in Tanzania and Uganda, and um, really the aim was to train sites and train laboratory technicians to be certified in rapid testing. So what you can see here on these maps is that there was one hub in each of the countries, and that they were connected to five to six spokes, which were different laboratory sites. And, um, and the program really allowed for the labs uh, throughout the country to um, share best learning practices 
and uh, and and have ongoing learning and mentorship um, through the Echo program. So, how might Echo support uh, viral load scale-up efforts? And these are just um, some uh, a few potential approaches that that can be taken to use Echo. None of these has actually been implemented yet. Uh, but one potential approach is to use ECHO to set up a global community of learning and practice among different countries. So in this approach, uh, the different countries would actually be serving as the spoke sites. And um, a, a country would uh, present a case that would describe a viral load implementation challenge. And it would seek help from the group of countries and subject matter experts on how to address that challenge. And some of the outcomes from this would be um, really being able to list the next steps and recommendations for how that country would address that challenge. Another potential approach is to really um, to use ECHO uh, at the individual country level. And um, so this first example is, is um, more of the traditional model of using ECHO for the management of virologic failure in patients. So in this approach, uh, case presentations would be from providers or adherence counselors who seek help with managing patients with non-suppressed viral load. And the outcomes would be measures of clinical improvement in patients that were discussed during the case presentation. And then another example at the country level could be developing an ECHO program that focuses on viral load quality improvement. So in this approach, um, case presentations would be from multidisciplinary team members. And um, they would be working together to try to optimize the capacity, efficiency, and quality of routine virologic, uh, viral load monitoring. And so the cases that might be presented would, uh, for example, be um, uh, the, a prolonged turnaround time for the return of viral load results. And, um, and the outcomes of such a model would include measuring whether um, work processes, work processes and, and systematic improvements were actually um, happening as a result of these ECHO sessions. So on this last slide, I've included the contact information for uh, myself as well as my coworkers at CDC who uh, have been intimately involved in launching ECHO programs in various countries. And also, I've included the website for the University of New Mexico. And the picture is of Dr. Sanjeev Arora, who is the founder of Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico. Um, and his passion for this model is, is contagious. So I, I would say um, I would highly encourage anybody who's interested um, in ECHO This is Diana. I, I'm, I'm not sure if um, Zambia has considered converting to or, or transitioning Thank you so much, some regions to for the excellent dry blood We will now specimen. take some time for um, discussion. I know that, that cold chain Please can take be an questions issue for our presenters and the Q and A board, box and if you really in the are webinar screen. And um, we will try to get uh, and, to as many questions in the time that we have platforms, remaining. Which actually are, um, so I will ask are for use our presenters with, the with first DBS. question that has come up. Or Roche platforms, so the first which question would require an in-country evaluation, from, but for which CDC from does Tembo have Aaron. some evidence of, and, of uh, the question use. is, here in Sampia, um, the Luwafala province of Zambia, it's really challenging to refer a viral right load now. specimen um, to NASA while maintaining cold chain. 
What suggestions are there to improve this situation? Would help you to I'd like to suggest that either Diana or Jason help network, answering that question. Um, that you might you. want to improve cold chain capacity for um, and, and where you would make or how you would make the decision about which legs of, of your cold chain are maybe too Thank you, Diana. Uh, the next question is from Balagoon Kehinde, uh, and I think it's also for Jason and Diana. Uh, based on the slide for viral load capacity and demand for Nigeria, it showed that the demand is below capacity. Experience in the region where I work, however, in Bennu State, is that the demand is higher than capacity, so that the only processing labor laboratory in the state has given quotas to IPs on a number of VL samples that can be logged in a week. Perhaps this is due to imbalance in the distribution of viral load machines to match regional demands. Diana and Jason, I don't know if you have some thoughts to share on this. Yes. So this is Jason. Um, what, we, what we're representing in that, that graph that basically is the aggregated national numbers. So actually, if you did disaggregate it by regions or provinces, you would actually see some uneven distribution. Some may be way under utilization and others may be above. Um, I do know that uh, Nigeria has about 26 or 23 labs. Hi. Uh, so, um, viral load, and I do know actually, uh, time, so I think actually the questions are referring to um, how to partner with uh, Project Echo at the University of Mexico. And actually, uh, and it's, next, um, uh, month or two, it's quite simple. I um, be it's really uh, them, uh, what they want is to really uh, document that there is a partnership in order to uh, um, look at how exchange information with each other. So, University of New Mexico really keeps a resource, move or it serves as a resource for uh, uh, materials that are used and, uh, for training um, so it is, throughout the world. It is challenging. And, I, I do think um, when you so by finding a partnership with UNM, um, uh, basically a, a country's may, program a has access to the resources. And um, UNM is also the then picture. able to so um, that, that uh, provide technical assistance and um, and also Thanks share so the resources Jason. from that country. The next question comes from so Ego. Uh, it's essentially Ego um, asks, what a signed agreement. Um, there is no Echo, financial obligation. Um, University of New Mexico B2, does please. offer um, Echo trainings, um, uh, which is about um, two to three days in Albuquerque, and um, and that training is also at no cost. Um, the only cost that um, comes to participants is what's required for their travel. So there, there is quite a lot of guidance, and, and there are tools that are being put together with regard to EQA for POC um, platforms. I think that um, UNICEF is actually leading the development of a toolkit right now, and USAID and CDC and Global Fund, CHI, uh, and EGPAF are all a part of the development of that toolkit. My understanding is that the toolkit itself will be released in May of this year. 
So what I would do is to um, keep, keep tabs on the AIDS-free website because as soon as that toolkit is released, we'll start to link to um, the rest of the tools that include an okay, EQA thank tool you very much, Ritu. Um, that can this help you with the development that we'll, of we'll that, for today. that EQA um, strategy. Um, I don't know that there that one exists results for the POC? currently for um, the, the EID so the cartridge for, for, Diana, and I'm sure um, will jump for gene experts, yeah. although there there is uh, a, for the gene expert TV cartridge, there does exist a program. So I would expect that that one would look very similar. For a layer Q, because it's such a new technology, um, that one may be a, a little bit um, longer in coming. But as I said, keep looking to the Age Free website um, and to ASLM and, and those other resources, because there will be a toolkit that does address EQA. Um, Thanks very much. Um, so we are out of time, and so that's, we won't be able to answer any more of the questions um, in this presentation, uh, but we will try and get them answered by the experts afterwards. Uh, we'd like to first thank all of the participants for your time, and certainly we'd like to thank our presenters for sharing their expertise. Um, in the next couple of days, you'll be receiving an email with a link to the recording today as well as the presentations. Um, I can see some of you are already filling out the poll about how well we did today with the webinar, and that's really helpful for us. We'll use the feedback to improve future webinars. Um, please also be sure to go to the AIDS-free viral load and early infant diagnosis knowledge base and sign up on the website to receive updates on the knowledge base. Thanks very much to everybody who joined us today. We, we appreciate your participation.